So as people filter in today, we thought we'd do a fun little icebreaker. If you guys want to let us know in the chat, which Leslie Nope you're feeling like this morning. <laughs> Um, it is Friday, so I'm kind of feeling somewhere between an eight and a five, probably. I just realized that my hair matches number four. Uh, <laughs> I got the perm on one side and the short uh, flat on the other. But I think today I'm more of like a three. <laughs> I feel like some, some comfort emotional eating should be going on. <laughs> we got a couple fives. A two. I like the two. That's good. Oh, that's <laughs> like we all need to. We all need to model Alyssa. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Caroline Askew, and my lovely co-pilot today is Laura Gargis, and we are so excited to be exploring the concepts of libraries as a virtual third space with all of you. Um, we are two members of a five-member library marketing and outreach team that oversees those efforts for the um, Georgia Highlands College Libraries. And we're hoping that the information from today's presentation you build engagement and a sense of community for your library. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments about anything from the next few minutes, then our emails are here. Reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. You might be here today because you work at an academic library and you're interested in how to reach more of your online students virtually, or you might work at a public library and you're trying to figure out whether to keep doing some of the virtual programming you've been doing during COVID once life goes back to normal. Whatever your individual reason may be, we're so glad you're here and we're excited to explore the concept of third space, academic librarianship, and how we've been filling this role since before we even knew it existed. One of the most exciting things about today's presentation is we are trying something new with a website called Padlet. So we are going to try and give a lot of opportunities for us all to learn from each other since authority is constructed and contextual. Um, so after each section where one of us talks for a long time, uh, there's gonna be a brief pause where you can visit this Padlet link here and you can leave questions, um, suggestions, best practices, what's worked for your library, because I think everyone's going to have a lot to add of what they've done at their own institutions here. And we'll check in um, at the end of the presentation with the Padlet and we'll see all of your comments and questions and kind of explore that together. So what is the third space? The idea of libraries serving as a third space isn't a new concept. It's been circulating around different journals and articles for the last decade, and libraries have been serving in this role long before we landed on the definition. Uh, sociologist Ray Oldenburg described the third space or place as somewhere that people spend time between their first place home and their second place work. It's a place dedicated to things that people can't or don't want to do at work or home, some people use it to focus, some for community, and some for relaxing and unwinding. Another uh, prominent no voice in the field, James Elmberg, has written many articles on how this idea of third space and libraries go hand in hand. The library as a place embodies security, but as a space embodies freedom. I felt like this quote kind of summed up the magic of libraries. It says, on one hand, libraries are places. They're settled in the sense that all the space has been defined and we can feel security and comfort from this sense of control. However, many users obviously feel drawn to the library for the spirit of freedom and adventure embodied in the space. Historically, we've also seen libraries serve as a third space throughout history by building community, uh, promoting intellectual freedom and democracy, and serving as a free and peaceful area for people to pursue their own hobbies and interests. So chances are, if you work in a library or are attending this presentation, you know how much our libraries and our spaces affect our patrons, but our patrons also affect our libraries. One key component to the idea of third space, according to Elmberg, is that people with less obvious social, political, or military power 
can still exert influence on the space by revisiting the represented structures of dominant cultures. They do so by simply occupying space and appropriating it for their own purposes. They carry with them social and cultural borderlands that create the need for negotiating and refashioning the meaning of spaces. We see this most commonly in our own libraries by patrons kind of adapting and changing our space to fit their needs by using it to focus, enjoy community, and relax. We see this focus aspect of libraries as a third space when we have students coming into the library for study rooms or computer use and for quiet reading time. A lot of students have said they don't focus as well at home and they enjoy doing their homework in a space they feel is centered around academic resources. The community aspect of libraries as a third space is evident in the many ways that libraries bring people together. We see this in the different student groups that we host in our space, the friendships created, campus events and speakers that stop by, and the sense of community fostered by having a space that is free to talk, share, and exchange ideas. This last aspect has really been emerging in the past decade of librarianship. Sometimes patrons come in with an assignment and need to focus, but sometimes patrons really enjoy just being in a space they aren't responsible for cleaning and they enjoy reading a book or browsing the internet without the pressures of a messy home or workplace. So we've given a brief little introduction to these concepts, but we want to know which category do you think your users use the most? Are you seeing a lot of patrons coming into focus? Are you hosting a lot of campus events? Um, are students stopping by in between classes to relax and unwind? Let us know in the chat. We have an A and a C. Anybody else? What you feel like student or students or patrons in general are using your library for? Big mix. Yeah. Kind of a little bit of everything. And it's so nice that as libraries, we get to serve that for our patrons. Absolutely. Jill, Joe, why is A difficult to do in your library? Noisy, busy? At um, Caroline and I work for the Calding uh, Library for Georgia Highlands College, and it's a very small site. And so we have, I think, it, on the regular, about 400 students. And so it's it's tiny, and we get not as much foot traffic, but that also means we can kind of dedicate um, time and space for students to fill these, these all three of these. I get it. In some of the busier, crowded libraries, it's probably real difficult for focus. Are you ready to move on? I am ready, ma'am. So Caroline has filled us in on the third space in general and, wh and what it means for us as librarians. And as we all know, there have been some reasons lately for us to evolve the third space. So what do we do when patrons are unable to come to our physical space? How can we make sure that we are still serving the need for libraries as a third space without the brick and mortar aspect? Uh, the pandemic provided an opportunity to face these challenges, and it brought to light many problems that libraries could or perhaps should have addressed earlier. While the restrictions that were put in place to fight the pandemic made it necessary for, uh, for many libraries to adapt their services to a virtual format, it also served another purpose. The focus on a virtual format exposed a lack of time and resources devoted to distance learners or patrons with a disability that made them unlikely or unable to visit our physical library spaces. It became clear that the idea of library as a third space needed to permanently evolve to serve not just face-to-face -face students, but also students who for various reasons were not able to take advantage of the physical space in the first place. Apart from the reasons that we've just discussed, there were a few other motivators for GHC libraries to both evolve and focus on our third space. 
GHC implemented some significant organizational adjustments that made it necessary for, for us to adapt. Uh, in September 2020, so mid-pandemic, the entire student life department was dismantled and reorganized through academic affairs. And this indicated or, or was a result of an institutional level push to invest in co-curriculars. As we all know, libraries are a natural conductor of co-curricular activities. And it was time for us to find a way to be more deliberate about making our activities bridge those gaps between departments and help our newly organized co-curricular and transitions coordinator present opportunities for students that were more academically geared than they might have been previously. Through the CARES Act, we acquired funding for laptops that made technology lending available that was previously out of our price range, um, allowing us to take down some of those barriers to access of the library as a third space digitally. Additionally, in order for us to serve as many students as possible, we saw a need to collaborate with faculty to be a presence in their courses through embedded librarianship. Now we will get into what we did at GHC to react to these nudges toward change. We identified the need to lean in quickly, as a lot of us did, to a digital library space. Perhaps your library was already making moves um, towards this or even already doing it well pre-pandemic, but at GHC it exposed a gap for us that we were not even consciously aware. To react quickly to follow those COVID restrictions and support the needs of a non-physical third space, in August 2020, when we returned to campus, we instituted a grab-and-go format for our materials lending, which means that we pulled the items for the patron, we went ahead and pre-checked it out to them and had it on a shelf for them to grab without any contact. Additionally, we changed policies to comply with the restrictions, such as no food or drink in the library, which we typically do allow um, on a limited basis, and removal of in advance reservation capacity for study rooms sorry, capability, not capacity. <laughs> we offered and advertised more non-book items than ever before. So laptop lending, telescopes for astronomy courses, and rock kits for geology courses became some of our most circulated items. Some of the immediate changes helped us think about some bigger overarching themes to plan around during this time. And we found that everything we were doing fit into the three categories that Caroline mentioned, the focus category, community category, or the relaxation category of us trying to serve patrons needs and find a way to still serve as that third space. To demonstrate some of the concepts in action, we're going to share what we've done in our own library to grow and create our virtual third space. So we'll begin with the discussion of these categories with focus, which we frame as the scholarly or more academic related needs. We found it helpful to ask these questions to guide decisions on serving our students and patrons in that virtual environment. Uh, how can we promote learning? How can we promote library services? And how can we help mitigate the challenges of a virtual environment? To embrace the focus uh, of third space, our goal was to let students and faculty know that even if the building was closed, the library was still somewhere that they could turn to for answers. Now, this is something that we missed pre-COVID. Our outreach efforts tended to be geared toward what we could do to get the students into our physical library spaces, take advantage of services that would help them with their studies. So we began to flesh out the virtual scholarly space with a significant revision to our library homepage to highlight virtual resources and make modifications to accommodate our policy alterations. We also created themed LibGuide content to go beyond our typical use of LibGuides, which is we usually, usually use LibGuides to assist with information literacy instruction. For example, uh, we created a charging into finals guide that includes scholarly resources and more to help students prepare for finals. Through the guide, we provided access to Lunch and Learns with uh, a librarian, a visual, sorry, virtual citation station, where we promoted just one aspect of our existing Ask a Librarian chat service and collated information on and how to access GHC departments outside of the library that could assist students, including student support services, tutoring, and the Writing Center. What worked for us with this guide? We were able to compile information in a holistic one-stop shop to make students' lives easier. And uh, I could be wrong, but we love to do that as librarians. <laughs> Here's all the information. <laughs> What didn't work, the guide does not get as much usage as we would like. 
So in the future, we're going to be trying different ways to promote the guide so that it can serve more students. And we still feel like it was a good start and something we want to continue. On to identification of focus-driven academic collaboration opportunities. In the, oh no, we're going to be doing this for more than two weeks scramble, uh, the library team collaborated with teaching faculty on modules giving instruction for MLA and APA format that can be housed within D2L courses uh, for, or sorry, upon faculty request. In an effort to be more inclusive of students who learn through being shown, uh, we created and released a set of targeted tutorials using our YouTube channel and social media called How To Library. And there were just quick two to three minute videos uh, on like one single aspect of library service. All of the focus services that I've talked about uh, were promoted through student email, social media, um, digital newsletters, which at GHC are GHC Inform for faculty and staff, and student inform for, you guessed it, students. What went well with these? The APA and MLA modules were well received and faculty feedback was positive. The YouTube series had a pretty decent number of views, um, and so that is exciting and something we're going to continue. What didn't work? Uh, updating prepared content like this can be difficult to remember to do, uh, especially with the other loads on our plates, and it, but it does cause the need for constant review. Um, this in itself really isn't a huge problem, but at GHC, we definitely need to organize and create a schedule for reviewing and refreshing content. Uh, in regards to instruction and reference, from the beginning of the pandemic, the librarians of, and library staff realized that we needed to be more deliberate uh, about using our virtual space as a way to perform reference and instruction with students. To start out, we, get, we began more heavily promoting our Ask a Librarian chat by emphasizing it on our website uh, with that revamp and using lots of word to mouth through encouraging students and faculty to use the service. Since things in the past 15 months have been a little topsy-turvy, we created a virtual reference schedule um, to ensure that our chat um, and presence in D2L were efficiently covered during all of our opening hours. For information literacy, we opened up our flexibility on, on modality and length of instruction. Uh, for example, we taught live Zoom course meetings, we compiled recorded videos for instruction, we even created some LibGuide content for use without an actual teaching session, just something we really wouldn't have done before. Um, and we generally, we generally just focused on working with teaching faculty to fit their needs and their students. Uh, we also expanded outreach to library, sorry, outreach to faculty by revision of our instruction request form to accommodate the flexibility that we were trying to introduce and marketing library services more directly to them. Now we've got an opportunity to use that wonderful Padlet and we're going to give you a minute to offer suggestions on what types of focus activities or resources you have tried at your libraries. Uh, what did you try that was great? What did you try that maybe needs some work? All ideas are good ideas and I'm sure we can all learn from them. Um, we'll go ahead and put the Padlet link again in the chat now. So take a moment to visit our Padlet and offer suggestions as comments in the focus column this time and ask questions in the Q&A column. And um, we will move on to our next section in one minute. everybody we are going to move on but we are going to check your comments questions suggestions everything in the padlet at the end of the presentation don't worry 
So now we're going to move on to the community aspect of Third Space. This is an area where the virtual format constantly changing and evolving is so exciting because almost every day there's a new app or website to help people engage and connect virtually. To guide our direction here, we thought about how we could keep having events or getting to know our students and making those connections while virtual. The questions that we asked ourselves to guide our practice here are, how can we connect personally with our patrons while virtual? How can we keep students and faculty engaged in our learning community? And how can we host successful online events? One thing that the library did was create some different social media series to kind of break the virtual barrier and help students know they were still communicating with human beings behind the screen. We did a series on pet coworkers, a what are you reading book recommendation, a big graduation video congratulating our 2020 graduates, letting them know how proud we were of them. Uh, we quickly learned that social media wasn't the only channel for us to reach out and build that sense of community. So we did incorporate a few uh, reading challenges, giveaways, um, spine poetry contests, and started a Tell Me More Tuesday series to get people engaging with the library. How did it go? Well, we found that although posting book recommendations and reposting the college's main social media post is easy, it doesn't generally get a lot of feedback or interaction. What really gets people excited is seeing human faces. <laughs> so whenever we post a member of our library team or a video with a human being in it, we get more engagement. This actually led to us incorporating a get to know us video into a routine post we do at the start of each semester that helps students kind of see the library staff and let them know which campus they're on and who to reach out to if they have questions. As far as tapping into our cross-campus groups and resources, this uh, was an area that we quickly learned to collaborate in because <laughs> when students can't come to campus and their entire academic experience is occurring online, we have to make sure that that online experience is en as engaging as possible. We had several collaborations for Constitution and Citizenship Day to help explain the democratic process. We uh, highlighted a green student organization for Earth Day, and we provided lists of local food banks and shelters to volunteer at or donate to during the holidays. Um, one of my personal favorite things that we did in this area was a collaboration with our fabulous archivist. Um, we did a Throwback Thursday post every week to celebrate our 50th year as a college, and that was really cool to get that engagement from people kind of seeing because some of them, you know, remember 50 years ago. So it was really cool. <laughs> As faculty, the librarians have moved quickly during the last uh, 15 months on several items that were really uh, already in the pipeline for us, but what that were accelerated or formalized due to the pandemic. Um, these efforts add to our virtual third space. So it's a huge benefit. We created a course shell in D2L called My Library. Um, students can access this course through D2L as any of their other courses. In the shell, we have a widget for our Ask a Librarian chat, discussion boards for students to have a different way to post questions, and content to help guide students with their research. At GHC, faculty librarians have recently been moved to the promotion and tenure track. As a part of that effort, we are now advising one-on-one -on -one with students um, we're also liaising with schools to be the main point of contact for the school and to market library resources and services to that faculty, to those faculty. Additionally, librarians are being encouraged to teach a four credit course. The current piloted course is in Area F as a special topics course on how to do research. What went well? The My Library course is a great way for us to help frame the library as an academic resource for students, and the course shell gets decent traffic. Advising has been a great way for the librarians to participate in students' academic lives in a more official capacity. Um, the four credit course will help increase the viewpoint uh, that the libraries bring in tuition dollars, which we all know is super valuable in academic in the academic world. What didn't work well? Uh, workload, as I'm sure you're not surprised. Uh, the advising, liaising, and teaching four credit courses are all add-ons to our, an already heavy responsibility list. 
Um, so we're going to have growing pains and adjustments that will continue um, for a while. We're going to take another brief pause now to give you some time to offer suggestions uh, on what types of community activities or outreach you have tried at your libraries. Oh, well, went great. Or what did you try that didn't do so well? What are you dying to try? Uh, well, the Padlet link, I'm sorry, I forgot to put it up the last time, but it's there now, fresh for you, <laughs> is in the chat. And I invite you to take a minute to offer your suggestions as comments in the community column this time and ask your questions in the Q&A column. And we'll begin back in just one minute. Okay, thanks for taking a minute to do that. We're going to move on to the relaxation aspect of Third Space. At GHC, we wanted to create the magic of the library experience that we all know and love. Um, but we wanted to, to transition that to virtual aspects uh, to minimize the stress and confusion for patrons in a difficult time. I know what you're thinking after a year we've had of Zoom meeting jumping and staring at a computer screen while our children destroy the house and our pets lay on our keyboard. Uh, virtual and relaxing at the same time? I'm not so sure. <laughs> but uh, we decided it's important to remember, especially in our era of special stressors, that one of the most important aspects of the third space is that lack of rigidity. Uh, no structure, just the ability to be. The most difficult part of that is that we have to remember to make the virtual space function for us and our patrons in that way. The key questions we asked to do this were, how do we create library ambiance excuse me, virtually? How can we minimize patron stress and confusion? And what resources can we highlight? So at GHC, we wanted to present the relaxing elements from a normal library visit, such as pop titles, ambiance, and a clean ad-free space. We did this by having a guide for promoting the new pop titles at each of our locations. And I have to give a huge shout out to Caroline here because this guy and the one I'll mention next were all her babies and they are beautiful. Um, so additionally, we, we also created a clean and simple monthly display lib guide uh, that took the place of our monthly window displays and highlighted video resources as well as books in those guides. The guide includes a library ambiance playlist that we borrowed from Spotify with the sound of turning pages and falling rain. And don't worry, we'll give you the link so you can take advantage of that. We also made efforts to replicate the self-care activities that we try to offer students on campus. For example, when we were on campus, we invite therapy animals to the library uh, during finals week to help encourage that relaxation. So to duplicate that, we, um, sorry, we added a live stream uh, links to puppies, um, other cute baby animals, finals and midterms guides so the students can kind of get that feel. And uh, we also include some yoga videos in our student guides. What went well with these? The monthly display and pop title lib guides offer much needed broad access to the work we do um, to offer students not just the resources they need, but also the resources they want. And that just feels good. Um, what didn't work? We don't really know or have an easy way of assessing how much use or what benefits students saw from these. Personally, I'm okay with continuing to offer these opportunities and know that if just one student sees benefit, then it's worthwhile. To further the commitment to rest and relaxation, we promoted student support services, self-care program, their student wellness guide, and we look for opportunities to make the resources we were creating and offering as low stress as possible. 
This led to having um, Zoom sessions if we had a need to be drop-in rather than by rigid schedule. And we tried to attend as many faculty workshops uh, as possible to learn how we could better serve students in this area. And we look forward to exploring more collaborations here. Librarians and library staff found ways to support students and colleagues uh, through some of the following things, soft deadlines and flexibility with each other, um, being upfront about a no camera option for Zoom to respect privacy and or the need to just not be seen. Uh, we promoted offerings from student support services like the food pantry and career closet that remained functional but modified during the time away from campus. We felt it was important that students knew that was still available to them. Um, we prioritize mental health for library faculty and staff through the creation of a coffee clutch. Uh, it's an optional weekly one hour drop in where we can get together virtually and chat. Um, this was created with the support of our library dean and we have found that it's a great way to support each other as well as get to spend time together when doing so physically is challenging. We have another opportunity here for you to offer suggestions on what types of relaxation activities or resources you have tried at your libraries. Um, what worked, what didn't, what would you like to try? I'm gonna put that Padlet link in the chat and I invite you to take a minute to go ahead and put some of your suggestions in there. Right, we are back. So as we've discussed here, there are a lot of ways to incorporate focus, community, and relaxing into your virtual services and create a third space for your library. But it's not a one size fits all. And honestly, you might already be doing a lot of this and not even realizing it. The key is just to keep a couple things in mind when you're brainstorming and creating your own virtual third space. Um, that's why we're going to go into accessibility, inclusivity, and sensitivity. When you're designing your online or virtual content, it has to be created with accessibility in mind. I'm not an expert in this area. There are so many people who know way, way more than me. But um, there, there's, this is an area where there's always room for improvement. Uh, patrons might be accessing your content with screen readers, so checking for accessibility or a, is a must. And if you're creating videos or presentations, then a script or captions being available can also help. It can be really intimidating to try new things, and being scared you'll get it wrong is completely normal. But with accessibility, just try and remember that doing anything towards accessibility is better than doing nothing at all. If we all take small steps and try and stay up to date on the latest checklists and technology, then that makes it much less of an insurmountable obstacle when we need to go through and update our created content. Inclusivity. The impulse might be to design virtual spaces and events the same way you design physical spaces and events, but this isn't always beneficial. Um, tweak the formula, make sure you're designing with distance learners in mind, keep times flexible, um, make events come as you are and try and do soft deadlines for any challenges, giveaways, or contests you're doing. Also, words matter. If someone's entire impression of the library is words on their screen, then I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. Then make sure that the words and content you're putting out there are going to make patrons feel included and not excluded. One unexpected benefit of COVID for our own library has been the opportunity it gave us to realize how we were underserving our online only students. 
Um, prior to spring 2020, they were left out of a lot of our events and marketing. So going forward, we're going to try and continue to look at who might feel excluded or not know about the services and resources we offer. And we're going to focus on finding ways to let them know how much we're here for them. Sensitivity. As Laura mentioned before, this is a tough time and the virtual digital format can be really tiring. Zoom fatigue is real, Zoom scrolling is real, and just staring at a screen when you want to be learning from a real life person is really hard as a student. One thing I've learned during my own journey with information overload and trying to cope during this increasingly digital age is how much of a difference organizations can make when they prioritize the end user's needs and comfort. Um, this is something that Jane Secker uh, discusses at length in her publication on virtual libraries as virtual learning spaces. She says, social networking tools on websites have the ability to help users manage information overload and find and use resources more effectively. Um, we can see this in practice whenever we come across a LibGuide that doesn't have both sidebars filled with pictures, text, and video. It might seem like a small thing, but this can make a huge difference to someone who's already stressing out about how to navigate your website and handle a lot of stimuli at once. So when you're curating your virtual third space or your website, just try and make sure you're creating uncluttered web pages, um, including some minimalistic activities and letting patrons know, like Laura said, that they don't have to turn their camera on if they don't want to. On this slide, we have a bunch of the resources that Laura and I have mentioned just a little bit. We have that website that has all of the cute baby animals <laughs> and some nature videos if animals aren't your jam. We have um, some Spotify uh, playlists and podcasts to embed in your own in your own LibGuides at libraries. And then we also have some accessibility checklists and just some of the our own library's resources that we've mentioned, so you guys can check those out if you want to take a look. In summary, today we've defined the third space through research, explored what a virtual third space could look like, and learned to keep in mind the considerations of accessibility, inclusivity, and sensitivity when you're creating your own virtual third space. So thank you guys so much for attending. We are going to Hop over to the Padlet now, and Laura and I are going to answer some of your comments and questions. And Laura, I can't see the chat in here, so if there's anything that I have missed, um, any questions by anybody, then yeah, if you could read those, and we'll also get started on answering those. Okay, I'll go through that. Let's see. And I'm going to share the I'm going to try and share the Padlet screen now. While you're doing that, there was a, a wonderful suggestion about creating a master lib guide. Uh, this was Jill Anderson, um, where she updated COVID related information. Um, sorry, I assume pronouns there. Uh, where Jill created um, COVID related information and policies and it and left those so that she they could import them into uh, regular lib guides which I think is really a great way. It's something I wish I did in general. I think that's such a great way to keep up with things. And there was also another lovely suggestion uh, from Alyssa that uh, a program called Fuzzy Friendly Friday, where they post pictures of pets with books and the faculty and staff will submit pictures to be shared on the Instagram. I love. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, I want to do that. I'm just thinking of how many pictures I can take of my dogs now <laughs> with books. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I need to go get a cat so I can take pictures of the cat with books. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we have one suggestion or comment in the focus column, collaborating with faculty on what they think will be useful for students and instruction spaces. And that is something that actually I think Laura has been doing it. There's a collaboration with our, uh, well, that might be a little different, CETL, Laura. Do you know anything about Susanna's? I think we've been kind of doing that um, with yes, the- one of, our, one of our faculty librarians uh, works with our CETL, which is our center for, what is it, education? No, excellence yeah. in teaching and learning. 
There you go. You got it. You got it. Uh, but she does, she spends a couple hours working directly with them. And so it's it's been nice to have that librarian representation with, you know, interaction with faculty. Uh, I think it just does a lot of good. So that's that's a great, that's a great idea. Oh, here's all of my comments. Let's see. For community in the community column, um, someone commented, we did a Happy Hearts program with our RAD Tech students. The library highlighted streaming video services that we have to offer and the department provided student speakers. It was fun. That sounds so cool. Oh my gosh. Oh, I love yeah. that. Um, I'd really like to do a tour for our local community centers. We have a really diverse population. I think it'd be one way to connect. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got our library. We have, is it five different? We have five different campuses. We only have libraries on, I believe, three of them currently. So, yeah, that's a great idea that we could do, too, is meet more of our community members. Yeah, I like that. I, I would ask the group um, if anybody has struggles as an academic library with community patrons. It's hit and miss for us at Highlands. Um, administration tends not love that aspect. But of course, as librarians, we want to make sure that everybody has access. And so um, I love that idea. And I just wonder if anybody sees struggles with that at their, at their schools. And it's okay if you don't. <laughs> Things are different everywhere. <laughs> All right, let's see if anybody added to the relax column. We have, oh, we have coloring pages. We have drop-in collaborative coloring and puzzle, ta puzzle tables. Oh, man. Ooh, I like. We had games. Um, this person, they collaborated with their veterans department and hosted a guest speaker, an author who wrote about his experience in Vietnam. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, those are some I love great. the puzzle table idea. I have a six-year-old at home, and I cannot have a puzzle table. So maybe we'll do one in our library, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> have a puzzle table. <laughs> It'll be you and I playing with students. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and then it doesn't look like anyone had any questions here, but I think it was because we had a few in the blue jeans. Printers. That's a great idea to give them something to do while they're waiting for their printing. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, anything. I'm sure you guys, if you work in an academic library, half of your job is printer questions. <laughs> that I think it should come along with the MLIS as also like a certificate in printers. <laughs> we should be sponsored by HP. <laughs> we really <laughs> should. Be. We should be able to get grants or something. <laughs> What's fun about librarians is not a single one of us minds doing that for students. This oh, yeah. How we roll. Sometimes it's nice because you're like, I know the answer to this question. I don't even have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, if there's not anything else, I think we might be ready to go a couple minutes early. Thank what you do? all for for coming to join us with this conversation and participating. And we're going to leave that Padlet up. Uh, so if you have ideas post, you know, post conversation here, um, please put them up and we'll be glad. We'll be checking it, too, so we can reply to questions. Uh, we'd love for it to be a space for the conversation to continue. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. You, too.